Almost 115,000 graves here at the Woodlawn Cemetery. Currently, we're in Dayton, Ohio. We're going to visit the grave of one former Dayton, Ohio gangster. His name was Dayton Slim, real name Charles Stimmel. And he was executed for murdering a man during a robbery in which he didn't get anything except the keys to a safe that he never used. Let's get right into the story. You know, I tell you this, some of us are born with an advantage in life. And some of us are born with a disadvantage. And some of us are born to a family of means. They're rich or even wealthy sometimes. And some of us are born to a family that is dirt poor. But most of us somehow make it somewhere, somewhere in the gray area called the middle. And for one, Charles Stimmel, he was in that gray area growing up as a child in the Dayton, Ohio area. Now, his mother, like all women back in those days, was a stay-at-home mom. And Charles' father was a carpenter. And he was a pretty good carpenter. And he taught his son everything that he knew about carpentry. Now, carpentry is a very very useful skill especially it is today because not many people are going to school for the trades people are going to school for whatever degree that they think they're going to use in the real world and they end up not using it all now charles he knew how to make a bench he could make you a chair and he could sell it to you and if he took his time and was patient uh, he could make a pretty penny off of his labor off of his skill but why would he want to do that when he could just steal your wallet? Most people, I believe, try to raise their kids as best as they possibly can. Uh, you do your best to instill morals and values in your children, and then you just kind of cross your fingers and hope for the best. And I'm sure that's what the parents of Charles Stimble did with him, but he wanted the easy way to make a means in life. Uh, he figured like this, uh, why the hell would I want to waste my time making a stupid table and sell it for $10 when I could just steal from you? So later on, as Charles came to the Dayton area, he would later hook up with a gang called the Cook Gang, which back in those days, gangs were basically named after the leader. And the leader of the Cook Gang was one William Cook. Uh, these guys were not uh, anybody special when it comes to gangs they were just doing the run-of-the-mill uh robbing mom and pop shops uh small time crimes robbing people or what have you maybe breaking into residences uh these guys as far as i know were not robbing banks um that's why a lot of bank robbers from back in the old days are very well known because nobody did that really because that was something where if you rob the bank you're gonna have the u.s marshals after you and back in those days they wouldn't stop until they got their man. So the Cook Gang is going around Dayton just doing uh, simple robberies, holdups, or what have you. And Charles would earn the nickname Dayton Slim because he was about six feet tall, but he only weighed about 140 pounds. So later on, uh, he would start dating William Cook's uh, sister, Rose. And later on, they would link up I'm not really sure if they would get married. You know, back in those days, if you were uh, shacking up with a chick or uh, as they, they call them, a lewd woman and you weren't married, you were uh, frowned upon. So they linked up. Maybe they got married. Maybe they didn't. Maybe it was just called a common law uh, marriage. Who knows? Now, you're going to go to November 22nd of 1902. Now, by this time... Slim, we'll call him Slim, uh, is starting to become the leader of the gang. He's being more of the brazen person when it comes to uh, robberies, when it comes to planning them out. And there's a local beat store in this area. And uh, Slim thinks that uh, this would be, you know, a good opportunity to make a, a couple of dollars on the side. So he enlists one of the Cook gang members and he says, hey, I'm just going to go to the feed store. We're going to hold him up. 
We're gonna wait till just about the, when they close and we're gonna pounce. November 26, 1902, Slim and his accomplice, they're targeting a feed store that is ran by one Joseph Scheid. And other than running this feed store, he also is a coal dealer here in the area. So around 5.30 p.m., they're closing up the shop. And Joseph is with two of the employees of the business. Now they're sweeping up, getting ready to shut things down for the day when one of the men looks up and peering through the window are two men wearing masks. One of them has two revolvers pointed right at them. They quickly run inside the business and they tell everybody, get your hands up, this is a robbery. So the men reach for the sky and one of the men asked Joseph, give me the keys to the safe. Now Joseph said, I don't have the keys to the safe. And as soon as he said that, the man shot him once in the leg, bam. So Joseph keels over in pain. And as soon as he keeled over, he shot him again. The second bullet went right through his chest and pierced his heart. He basically died instantly. So one of the men runs out of the room and hits the alarm. Now you got the bell ringing. And the third man says, I'll get you the keys, I'll get you the keys. They got the guns drawn on him. He goes into the next room. He goes under the desk, grabs the keys and tosses it to them. Now they run to the safe, but they're having a problem opening it for some unknown reason. And that bell is still ringing. So they just hightail it out of there. They didn't even get nothing for the robbery. Just the key to the safe. That's all they got. And as they ran by this little girl, she noticed that the two men ran past her and the bell for the uh, burglary was ringing. They ran right past her into the woods where they linked up with a third man and then they just disappeared. The police come, they do their investigation. And of course, like I said, Joseph succumbed to his injuries. So now they're looking for a robber that is a murderer. Now they get uh, the two witnesses and the little girl who witnessed the men running outside. And they, they said, okay, tell us, give us a description of what they look like. So one of the guys was kind of tall, really skinny, uh, had brown hair, looked like this, looked like that. Um, the other man never spoke and he had kind of like a smooth face, like just weirdly smooth, like maybe he was really young or something like that. We're not really sure. So immediately, one of the detectives that's leading the investigation, Detective Walter Hughes, immediately, when he hears tall and skinny, he's thinking of Dayton Slim. Now, immediately, they go to the office and they start printing up flyers because now Dayton Slim is wanted for murder, or at least maybe wanted for questioning, whatever. So listen, it's 1902 and you're a criminal, you like to commit crimes, can't stop committing crimes, and now you see or you're hearing from your friends or, and or associates that there is a flyer with your picture on it. Now, this is a game of cops and robbers, and normally, if you're a robber, see, put yourself in the position of somebody who likes to rob people for fun or for pleasure or for profit, whatever. If you see a flyer with your name on it, for a murder, an innocent man is, even though you're a criminal, you're an innocent man. You wanna get this taken care of as quickly as possible. So you're gonna tell the detectives, hey, listen, I didn't do this. So do whatever it is and whatever investigation you need to do to clear my name, because I didn't commit this crime. However, Slim didn't do that because he was guilty. So when he sees the flyer, he hightails it out of town. He jumps on a train with Rose and they start heading out to Springfield where his father has a farm out there. So they go out to the farm, they hide out for a day or two, and then they hightail it to another area and then they just disappear. 1902, you disappear, you could be anywhere. You could take a train out west and that's it. No one will ever know who you are. Now they would have got a, gotten away with this murder 
Except, you know, a lot of detectives, when they work for many years, they start developing, uh, I guess you can say, they start developing uh, their own repertoire of uh, tricks in their bag of tricks where they would use to kind of, you know, get a criminal out of hiding. So Detective Hughes, he tells the post office in Dayton, he says, listen, uh, if you get a package coming from such and such address, uh, being the address of where his parents lived, give us a holler. About a year later, the post office calls Detective Hughes and they said, yeah, we got a package that was sent from uh, Mrs. Stimmel out to a, uh, a, Char a Mr. and Mrs. Charles uh, Crowley or Crowley, some name, uh, with an address based in Denver. So, okay, so we got something. So they have an address in Denver. They alert the police in Denver, give them the address, and they say, this is what he looks like, and we're looking for him. He's wanted for the murder of Joseph Scheid. So Denver detectives go out to the address and they're basically doing a stakeout and they're waiting for the person to come out of the address to pick up the package. And lo and behold, guess who comes out to pick up the package? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, it's Mrs. Crowley or whatever fake name they used. And so she yells for a man, a man comes out and it's Dayton Slim. Well, they think it's Dayton Slim because of the uh, description that the police back here in Dayton gave him. So immediately when Dayton comes out, they jump out and it's like, freeze, you freaking whatever they said back in those days. So they grab him, they place him in cuffs and they take him down to jail. Now he's denying it. He's like, man, my name is Charles Crowley or Cooley, whatever fake name he's giving them. I don't know what you're talking about. So the detectives, they message the guys over here. They say, yeah, we got him. He's in jail. So they catch the next train out to Denver and they go to the jail and lo and behold, yeah, it's uh, Dayton Slim. Like, oh, I finally got you. And Dayton was like, Slim. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm not Dayton Slim. My name is Charles Crockley, whatever your fake name is. And they said, shut up, you idiot. Like, just come on, let's go. So they extradite him back to Dayton and he comes and stands trial for the murder of Mr. Scheid. Now he's facing the death penalty. Now, normally death by hanging was the preferred method of execution in the country uh, back in the olden days, but we got this uh, invention. It's, it's been used a little bit and it's, the technology's not perfected yet, but um, it's called the electric chair. So he's facing the electric chair and the electric chair is supposed to be a very painless, quick, easy way to go you get hit with a bunch of electricity and it renders you unconscious and that then your insides cook i don't know how that's supposed to be a uh, a peaceful way to go but that's how they did it back in those days now i don't know why but for some unknown reason rose his fake wife was not uh, charged with uh, aiding and abetting a fugitive however she was called to testify and the case against him, which she refused to talk. So she ended up later on uh, being arrested for contempt of court. Now he went on trial and eventually he was found guilty of the murder and he was sentenced to die via the electric chair. Now he did get a couple of reprieves from the governor at the time of Ohio. So they, they stayed off the execution for a few months but they sent a tentative date of July 24th, 1904 as the date of the execution. And you're a condemned man, what are you gonna do? So, Mr. Slim wakes up on the very early morning hours of July 24th, 1904, and it's gonna be your last day waking up. That's it, that, this is your last wake up. So he wakes up, he's a dead man. And by all accounts, he was pretty calm considering he was about to be fried. He had his last meal. He dressed in whatever clothes he was set to be buried in. It's kind of how they did it. Like when he'd be executed, those would be the clothes that she would wear. And he walked to the chair. And you see that uh, weird looking wooden chair 
and he has a seat. Now, no matter how stoic you're gonna be, once you sit down in that chair, I'm going to imagine that once those straps start coming over your legs and your arms, you start getting a little bit nervous. But they're putting on the straps and the warden is more nervous than he is. Now, before they place the hood or the blindfold on him, Slim says, wait a minute, stop right there. And the warden is taking it back. He says, listen, I, 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 got, I got something to say before you guys do this. And the warden was like, okay, go ahead. What do you got to say? And he said, quote, may the curse of a dying man be on Judge Cumler, on Prosecutor Martin, and on his assistant, Charles Cumler, for sending me here. I have never killed anyone. Now go on with your dirty work. And well, they put the blindfold over him or the hood, whatever you want to call it. And they hit the switch. And a lot of volts of electricity coursed through his body and he was pronounced dead. And that was all of one, at the time, notorious gangster, Dayton Slim. So after he, his body cools, I guess, they would have to wait a little bit. They came, got his body, put it uh, on a horse-drawn carriage that the funeral home provided, and they made their way up to the mother's home. A grieving mother sees her son dead, and they take him here to the Woodlawn Cemetery, and they bury him right here, and over, well not over, but almost 120 years ago in this very spot, right where I'm standing, you had one Rose Cook, a mourning wife or girlfriend, whatever you want to call it, his parents, and I don't know how many people, maybe some of the Cook gang, they were all standing here crying, mourning for their fallen comrade, Dayton Slim. And later on, the Cook Gang would go on to turn into the Miami Valley Gang. And then like many gangs in the world, uh, they would uh, quickly die off. But not like nowadays where gangs are usually kind of keeping their numbers somewhat. Some gangs die off. Uh, some gangs, they keep going. Gangs, gangsters, gangs all over the country. Gangs that uh, I do intend on doing future videos about. I'm going to I'm going to get into the world, the very dangerous world of gangs. Maybe we'll visit some gang hoods, maybe we'll get to talk to some gang bangers or former gang bangers or whatever. Who knows? Who knows? But um, as I always say, payable on death. All right, guys. I'm out of here. It is 93 degrees and the humidity is high. I am covered in sweat. I know some of you did not want to hear that. A shower awaits me at my local gym. Anyways, hopefully one day soon I'll come back out here. There is many, many, many stories and uh, I'd like to do a nice long uh, one hour long video i do mean to do more of those more often it just you know it takes a little bit of time but uh, i'll come back out here all right guys thank you for watching my video i always appreciate it i hope to see you on the next video live but not live but still alive by the grace of god i am lamont at large i will see you on the next video see i told you i was sweating very very sweaty Woo! Woo! yikes Time for a new hat. Peace out.